How's everybody doing this morning? Our vacancy pastor is on vacation this week. Um, I'm Ken Gens. I'm Ken Gens. I'm one of the council members here. Um, our organist is not here this week either. She's on vacation. So we're, we're trying a bunch of things today. Um, I do not have a microphone. A microphone is being used to broadcast um, the songs and the music over our speakers. So bear with me. We'll do the best as we can. So um, we'll start with our opening hymn. <laughs> Of the leading nation to whom the house of Israel comes. 
Travel to Kalna and look. Go from there to Hamath, Rabbah, and go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than those kingdoms? Are their territories greater than your territory? You who are trying to pull off the evil day, you bring near the session for violence. Those who lie on ivory beds, sprawling upon their couches, eating lambs from the flock and calves straight from the stall, improvising tunes on the lyre, composing music for themselves on musical instruments like David, drinking large bowls of wine. They slather themselves with the most expensive perfumed oils, but they do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. That is why they will go into exile as the first of the exiles. Those who sprawl out of their feast for the dead will be punished. Our second reading comes today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 6 to 16. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we certainly cannot take anything out. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be satisfied. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge them into complete destruction and utter ruin. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evils. By striving for money, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. But you, O man of God, flee from those things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who made a good confession as a witness before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this command without spot and without fault until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will make known at the proper time. The blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone, who alone has immortality, who lives an unapproachable life, whom no one has seen or is able to see. To him be honor and power forever. Amen. Please rise for our gospel lesson. The gospel comes to us from Luke today, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31 the familiar story of Lazarus and the rich man. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things? But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn, warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. And we continue with the hymn of the day.
Grace, peace, and mercy be yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that I'd like to consider with you this morning is the Gospel lesson for this day from Luke chapter 16, which was read for you a few moments ago in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has entrusted us with the greatest of wealth, <clears throat> your fellow redeemed. Who's the wealthiest person in the world? I researched that this past week and found out that in the year 2021, that distinction belonged to Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, whose net worth is estimated to be $241 billion. He is followed by Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon, whose net worth is about $144 billion. Third on the list is a man by the name of Bernard Arnault of France, who is the CEO of LVMH, which owns such ultra-luxury products such as Louis Vuitton, Sephora, and Christian Bale. Who is the wealthiest person in your community? Who is the wealthiest person among your circle of friends? Who is the wealthiest person in your family? Most of us could probably answer those questions with a certain amount of accuracy. Because we observe people, and we tend to classify them based on their wealth, their lack of it. How big is their house? kind of car do they have? What types of investments do they have? We spend a lot of time assessing the wealth of people, ourselves included. Well, God does the same thing in his word. He makes assessments about wealth. But he doesn't do it in the way that we might think he would do it, according to our world. As we consider these words from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, we're going to do so this morning, viewing wealth the way God does. And as we do that, we will see that wealth in this world is fleeting, but wealth in Christ lasts forever. There are some people who call this Luke 16, 19 to 31 account of a parable of Jesus, but there are also a lot of biblical scholars who believe that Jesus is actually describing an actual occurrence here. That's not a parable. Because you see, the main characteristics of a parable is that one or more of its parts stands for someone or something else. And that is not the case here. In this story, Lazarus is Lazarus, the rich man is the rich man, Hades or hell is Hades or hell. Abraham is Abraham. There is nothing in this story that stands for something else. So it probably is not a parable of Jesus, but probably is a real account that he is given. Let me ask you a question. True or false? The rich man in Jesus' story lived a miserable and unhappy existence because of his wealth? Well, I think you know the answer to that is false. He was a man who was dressed in the finest clothes, he ate the best food. He apparently did not have a care in the world. You know, sometimes we think that wealthy people who are not Christians are very unhappy with their life. And some of them are, no doubt about that. But many of them are. Many, many wealthy people are very happy with their lives. I ask you another true or false question. The rich man in Jesus' story went to hell because he was rich. The answer to that is also false, isn't it? It wasn't because of what he had, but what he didn't have. That was the reason why he ended up in hell. 
It was because his material wealth, not God, held first place in his heart. It was because his trust was in his wealth and not in God. And it was because his love was for himself and for his wealth and not for God and his neighbor. He very simply did not believe in God or God's promise. When you look at earthly wealth, you quickly come to discover that it is a very fickle and fleeting God because it can so quickly be lost and be stolen. It can be poorly invested. It can be wasted. It can disappear just like that without fulfilling any of its promises of giving us peace, joy, and happiness. But even if wealth does hold up for this life, it certainly shows itself fleeting in the life to come. And that is the warning which Jesus is speaking to us today. You see, God knows our human hearts. God knows that wealth has a way of blurring our vision, and especially our spiritual vision. It has a way of becoming all-consuming in our lives. It has a way of setting itself up in our hearts and dethroning God from those hearts. And that is why the psalmist gives this warning. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. <clears throat> you see, this rich man's wealth did him no good when he died. It couldn't buy him eternal happiness. He couldn't buy him a place in heaven. He couldn't make him right with God. He couldn't cover his sins with forgiveness. He couldn't make him holy. He could not buy him peace in eternity. Look for a moment where that rich man ended up. In hell. A place of torment. He cried out for Abraham to send Lazarus to dip the, the uh, tip of his finger in some water and simply touch his tongue with that water because he was in agony in the flames of hell. What kind of evil place must this be where even a simple wet fingertip is considered to be a luxury? The second point is that once you are in hell, there's no way out. Abraham said, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not, and none may cross from there to us. You see, it's very clear there are only two destinations in the next life. There is heaven to strive for at all costs, and there is hell to avoid hell. And once you have arrived at one of those two destinations, you are there for eternity. The third point is that the secret to entering heaven and avoiding hell is found in God's word. When the rich man wanted Abraham to send someone back to earth in order to warn his brothers so that they could avoid the wrath and the fire of hell, Abraham's response was, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Those words teach us that the word of God is even more effective than the witness of someone who died and then rose from the dead. This point is so important that Jesus actually has Abraham say it twice. When the rich man asked Abraham to send Lazarus to his brothers, Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. When the rich man insisted that surely the word of someone who rose from the dead was more powerful than the word of God, Abraham said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You see, Jesus said the same thing in two different ways. 
He really wanted his hearers to remember what he said. And he really wants us to remember what he said. The word of God is more powerful than the message of someone who wrote something. Look at the religious landscape of our world today. And you will find it is filled with all kinds of marketing schemes to try to get people in the doors of the church. There was a large mega church near Chattanooga while I was serving a vacancy up in Knoxville, Tennessee, which on Easter Sunday actually held a fully sanctioned rodeo inside their sanctuary in the hopes of drawing more crowds. There are churches who have figured out how to have indoor fireworks displays. I have seen videos of pastors beginning their worship service by riding down the aisle on motocross bikes, horses, and even ATVs in order to get attention as they walked into the church. One pastor and his wife actually set up a bed in front of the church and sat on that bed throughout the service while they talked about married life, all in an attempt to try to get more people inside the doors of their church. Friends, there is no man-made marketing gimmick that will produce faith. The only way that we can have that saving faith that will receive eternal life is through the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts. And you know what? The Holy Spirit has promised to work in no other way except through the Word of God. The Gospel and God's Word and sacrament. Those are the means that the Holy Spirit uses to create and to sustain How do we view this world's wealth? Isn't that the question God would ask of us today? Do we view worldly wealth as the be-all and end-all, the ultimate goal of life? To have as much of it as we possibly can? Do we view it as the thing that God entrusts to us which will give us status, will give us worth, will give us importance in life? and will give us higher standing in the eyes of other people. Do we view worldly wealth as the thing that brings us confidence for the present, for the present, and then also for the future? Do we view it as something that can bring us happiness and good <coughs> Do we view worldly wealth as God views it? Because when it all comes down to it, what does it matter how much money we have in the bank? Or what kind of wealth status we have achieved when we die? You're not going to take it with you. It's going to be left behind for someone. Oh dear God, forgive us for the times when we have allowed our emotions and our joy to be dictated by the amount of wealth that we have. God forgive us for judging status, our own status and the status of others, based on the amount of wealth that they have accumulated. And God, thank you for pointing this out to us in the pages of your word. Because it is only then when we view wealth and our attitude toward it as God does, only then can we return to assessing what true and lasting wealth is all about and where it can be found. Another true or false question. Lazarus loved living in poverty. He had a great time with it while he was on. Well, obviously that's false. Life was painful and difficult for Lazarus. Poverty is not fun. In fact, there's a prayer in the book of Proverbs that speaks about the difficulties of life 
and the dangers to faith that come along with extreme power. Listen to Solomon's words in Proverbs 3. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. Another true or false question. Lazarus went to heaven as a reward for his living a life of poverty. Once again, false. Living in poverty does not win a person's special points with God. It doesn't make him more worthy of God's mercy and favor. It wasn't what Lazarus didn't have, but rather what he did have that landed him in heaven. You see, Lazarus was in possession of something that far surpassed, far outweighed, and far outlasted any kind of worldly wealth. It was a wealth that was viewed by God as the most precious kind of wealth. It was a wealth that had nothing to do with the size of his wallet or the size of his bank account. No, his wealth was found in his heart. We find a clue about why Lazarus went to heaven when we see who he joined there. It was Abraham. And we might even know that Abraham was very wealthy while he was on this earth. But he had a better wealth than worldly wealth in his heart. His wealth came through his faith and trust in the coming Savior. Remember what was said about Abraham? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was his faith in the coming Savior that made Abraham truly wealthy. Faith in the coming Savior was what made Lazarus truly wealthy as well. Yes, that Savior was walking among him at that time. And that Savior would soon walk the path to Calvary, where he would be hanged on a cross, where he would die for the sins of mankind then rising and triumphantly on the third day. Abraham and Lazarus both experienced what the Apostle Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians when he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his power, might become rich. By God's grace, dear friends, you and I have experienced that richness in Christ as well. It was because Jesus gives us his righteousness, his perfection, something that money cannot buy, that we now are richly dressed members of God's family. That is a wealth which does not flee and does not fail. That is the wealth that we are encouraged to pursue. The Apostle Paul says it this way when he writes to his youthful co-worker Timothy, But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. That great wealth is revealed to us in the pages of God's Word. It is in those pages that God shows us his son and shows us all the riches that are ours through his son. It is through that word of God that God wants us to go out into the sin-sick world and tell others where they can find true and lasting. Let me go back to those first questions that I began with today. Who is the wealthiest person in the world? Who's the wealthiest person in the USA? Who's the wealthiest person in your community? Who's the wealthiest person in your family? Who wants to be a billionaire? Let me tell you this morning, 
by God's grace, you are. You are on God's richest list because you have a true and lasting wealth in your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A wealth that no one can take from you. And a wealth which will endure through all eternity. God bless you, fellow rich people in Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. We also join in the prayer of the Thomas. Our Father, who art in heaven,
the Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We continue the service with the doxology.